tank. Cool name. And that's what I first said about the GWM Tank 300 Hybrid at its local launch 12 months ago at an off-road facility in Victoria. And it's also what I said about the petrol version that came through the chasing car's garage mid-year and hit showrooms about the same time. However, the hybrid was nowhere to be seen and in fact it's taken 12 months for GWM to land hybrid versions of this 4x4 wagon in Australia. Why? It's the old production delayed chestnut and it's something that has affected the GWM or a small electric as well. But now the GWM Tank 300 Hybrid is here and I get a chance for a week to see what it's like in the real world with everyday driving. Given that this is my third personal swing at the Tank 300, what did I say about it in the first two reviews? I call the hybrid a more credible contender than we'd expected and it was surprisingly capable off-road. And I call the petrol a seductive do-all package at an enticing price and it was at 47,000 drive away. And we gave it a commendable 8 out of 10 in both of those reviews. So now I'm interested to see how this normal turbo petrol hybrid format and 4x4 goes with everyday driving and everyday ownership. Chasing cars, honest reviews of your next car. Brought to you by Budget Direct. At 60,990 drive away, the Ultra Hybrid is the absolute tree topper of the four variant range. However, that's a fair step up from the basic petrol Lux version at 47 grand drive away. The lovable baby Jeep Wrangler and Ben's G-Wagon love child looks remain. Ultra does get 18 inch wheels that do fit the guards a little nicer than the 17s on the Lux. At almost 4.8 meters in length, it's this sort of Goldilocks size between medium and large. It sits quite tall too, with 228 millimeters of ground clearance. And speaking of clearance, you do get 33 degrees of approach angle and 34 degrees of departure angle. Back in January, it also proved to me that it could actually wade a fairly deep body of water. 700 millimetres according to GWM, which is pretty extraordinary given that you've got a turbocharged petrol electric drivetrain. Ladder frame construction, dual range drive and locking diffs front and rear, it certainly got the hardware that suggests it's very capable for 4x4. And I must say, it proved itself quite admirably across the rough stuff when we drove it in Victoria 12 months ago. As I have covered off in two reviews past, the large and boxy proportions of the Tank 300 do make for fairly spacious interior, so let's check out the cabin. Inside the Tank 300 Ultra is quite the charmer, however, it is terribly plasticky here on some of the surfaces. Had this been the petrol Ultra, I would say that this cabin really punches above its weight. However, because of the cost of the hybrid, I do think that this identical layout here pretty much meets expectations head on. I do like the blocky theme here that kind of robs from rivals such as Jeep Wrangler and Ford's Bronco, but I do think GWM gets more of a luxe vibe. You do get Napa leather accented seat trim and some very neat diamond stitched inserts on the doors and it does give it a nice upmarket lift. And the turbine air vents are sort of retro charming, but they do always remind me of Mercedes-Benz. It does strike a nice balance in that there's nothing that's agricultural in here, although it's not overly cushy and does feel like a genuine 4x4. And you do get plenty of all-terrain mojo, particularly when it comes to the grab handles on the dash fascia and on the doors. It does get dual 12.3 digital display that's countersunk quite nicely into the dash, though it is worth pointing out that this is also available almost identically in the base model. The media system, though, is just okay. It's a bit slow and a bit clunky, but you do get wireless CarPlay and digital radio, which is not fitted to any of the petrol versions. I've said it before and I'll say it again, the 360 degree camera system on this car is fantastic and the top spec version does get six parking sensors. You also get the neat transparent chassis function that uses the front cameras to project footage of the road underneath the car when you're on those tricky off-road courses. It's a nice wide cabin and it does feel quite airy in here and a lot of that has to do with the very upright A-pillars, the generous glass house and the fact that you get a sunroof. All the controls in the center console are laid out quite logically, but you do get this rather strange pistol grip transmission selector. In terms of little quirks, you do get an analog clock, and you get this nice little arrangement where the cubby slides backwards to reveal two cup holders. Right, let's check out row two. Tank 300 does offer a huge amount of room in the back, and this is what you would expect from a large segment SUV. Another thing is this big boxy shape allows plenty of headroom as well, and you do get these concave cutouts. Better still, the door apertures are nice and large. You get grab handles on the B pillars so you can climb in and the floor is actually nice and flat. It is a little bit darker in here than up front, but kids will like it in the back here because the rear window sills are actually quite low. And while we're at it, the nice presentation and materials from the front row do continue all the way through to the second row. The rear seat is actually quite comfy. This would be a pretty comfortable place to spend the long hours grand touring. 
In terms of amenities, you get a couple of map pockets, rear air vents, a couple of USB-A ports, and a fold-down center armrest with the expected two cup holders. Again, there's nothing rough and tumble in here, and this would make a pretty nice surrogate luxury SUV for around town. The tank fits a swinging rear door. Why? Because who wants to contend with the weight of this spare wheel when you're trying to lift a tailgate? However, the downside is if you like reverse parking in a tight spaces like the supermarket, you do run into some clearance problems. You do get around 400 to 450 litres worth of boot space. GWM is insane, but it is a nice square load space so you can put in bulky objects. The other advantage too is that you do get 12 volt and two 20 volt outlets in the wall if you do want to power those white goods while you're out in the sticks. And when you do drop the second row, there's probably enough left in there for a swag that might be comfortable enough to sleep in when you're out camping. In terms of ownership, the Tank 300 is covered by GWM's seven-year unlimited kilometre warranty. Consumption-wise, it's claimed to return 8.4 litres combined. However, it does reach up into the 11-litre mark when you do drive it around town. Now, while that sort of consumption won't cause rival Toyota's engineers to lose any sleep, it does run on cheapy 91-ron fuel. All right, we're off on the road, and instantly, there's a huge annoyance. This car keeps on talking to me, but we're going to cover off more details on that a bit later. Next, disclosure time. Now, I really like the petrol version of the Tank 300, but it did drive a few months ago. It offers 162 kilowatts and 380 newton meters, and it is quite smooth and refined with plenty of squirt to get things moving. For many buyers, you wouldn't need any more than the petrol engine. However, that doesn't cover wants, which brings us neatly to the hybrid. Now, in sheer stats alone, you would expect a fair amount of character and cojones, and here's why. The hybrid packs a high compression turbo engine that outputs 180 kilowatts and 380 newton meters. And added to that, you get 78 kilowatts and 268 newton meters from the electric motor. All up, you get 255 kilowatts and a stonking 648 newton meters. Unlike the petrol version, which fits an eight speed auto, the hybrids fit a nine speed conventional automatic transmission paired to the four x four system. The key benefit, well, it feels much quicker by the seat of the pants. And despite its considerable 2.3 ton heft, it does return better fuel economy than the petrol. GWM claims that the petrol version returns 9.5 litres combined, whereas the hybrid version is 8.4. Now for a hybrid, that's hardly what you would call rosy consumption. However, GWM has been pretty frank about the fact that this hybrid system is more attuned to prowess and performance than it is frugality. However, it's not quite as gutsy or as seamless as I was hoping for. On character alone, is the hybrid version worth the extra splurge? Well, that's debatable, but let's talk about ride and comfort. Without any diesel clatter, it's much quieter and more refined than your average mid-size off-road wagon. You have to start hunting for something like Toyota's Kluger to find something that's this plush on road. So the tank fits double wishbone front and coil spring rear suspension and you got reasonably pliant dampers and fairly chubby 60 series tires. So all of it does ride considerably nicer than your average tie built wagon. However, it doesn't quite filter out some of the finer ripples in the road. As you might expect, it's not exactly what you call an athletic handler. However, it does sit reasonably flat and it's quite cooperative at the helm. And for the most part, it settles in nicely as a long haul cruiser with that four x four capability once you get to the rough stuff. However, if there's a downside to its touring chops, it's that brake towing is capped at two and a half tons, and it should be much more of that for a vehicle with this much torque. In terms of safety, the tank was rated five stars by ANCAP back in 2022, and it loads in lots of active safety. So you get the typical stuff like forward AEB, active lane keeping, and rear cross traffic alert, but in this one, it's rear cross traffic alert with braking. And this flagship also gets a few other bells and whistles. So you get some advanced stuff like front cross traffic with brake, a so-called highway travel assist, and what GWM calls reverse assist with auto parking. And as mentioned before, this is the only version on the lineup that fits six rather than four parking sensors. So what's wrong with this? It's really, really, really poorly calibrated. And as you can probably tell by my in-car PTC, is the fact that the car keeps on yelling at me every eight or 10 seconds. What are some of those warnings? Well, let's start with emergency lane keep. At about 60 kilometers an hour, the in-dash indicates that the emergency lane keep is activated and it starts tugging at the wheel. And that's around town. And the lane keeping sensors themselves are pretty wayward because they keep on warning you that you're going over lines that you're not. 
Now, school zones are fair enough, but there's a couple of other areas where this car is just incessant all the time. And one of those is lane merging. Every time you come to a cross street and there's an on-ramp or an off-ramp, it says that the lanes are merging. But the worst offender is the driver attention system, which will bleed at you if you divert your gaze from anywhere other than straight out the windshield. What that amasses to is this constant litany of the car basically over nannying your driving. It's utterly incessant and infuriating. And as we've discovered, it's almost impossible to turn off most of these systems and warnings. Now, I'm all up for safety as much as the next person, but it's just utterly overly heavy handed in this vehicle. And the warnings in my time with this car are starting to drive me bonkers. I did gush a fair bit about the Tank 300 petrol when I did review it a few months ago. And that's not because it's particularly groundbreaking, but it does do a lot of things reasonably well. If there's a real merit to greatness, it's that the petrol version offers supreme comfort and decent off-road ability at a price that its rivals really can't match. The hybrid version brings a lot of that same goodness and a swifter kick up the backside, but it's 10 grand more expensive. And while the hybrid version isn't quite the steel that its petrol sibling appears, it is actually pretty decent value for money. However, I must say I was expecting a bit more action and nicer drivability from the turbo petrol hybrid powertrain for the premium that it commands. But if there's one area that comes very, very, very close to being a deal breaker, it's the incessant strong arm safety systems. Apparently GWM has put some effort into fixing some of the foibles of its lane keeping and following technology. However, I do not remember the petrol version being as quite annoying as this hybrid. Then of course there are the big pluses in that it's built solid, it looks pretty cool, it's quite spacious, and it just offers a lot of bells and whistles for the money. It brings a big sense of occasion, however, its imperfections are really gonna cause me to drag its rating down to around seven and a half out of 10. While if you're really drawn to the Tank 300, do not disregard the petrol version because I actually reckon it's the sweetest spot in the range. So that's what I think, but how about you? Put your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe while you're at it. And as always, thanks for watching Chasing Cars.